Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness, I say to myself, the Lord is my portion. Therefore, I will wait for him. Hello, family. Beautiful rain last night. You can all expect to mow your grass tomorrow, probably. <laughs> so, let's all stay in open with word prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we just thank you and praise you that your mercies are new every morning, Lord. Just uh, praise you for allowing us to gather here today. We praise you for the rain, Lord, and we just praise you for the breath we breathe. Pray this day that you'll be in it, guide and direct it, and speak to us through it, and we'll give you the praise. Amen. You may be seated. A couple announcements uh, for this morning. Um, you'll find in your bulletin a little uh, envelope here. We are giving a love offering to Teen Challenge. If it's in this envelope, we're gonna, it's going to Teen Challenge. So uh, in your tithes and offerings, just go ahead and put it in the box with the rest of the stuff and, and uh, that'll go to them. So, any other announcements? I just wanted to let the ladies know that the Wednesday uh, morning Bible study will not be held this week. Okay, okay we're no taking Bible a break today. Right. Okay. Sure. Mike. You also notice too, while he's walking over there, uh, August 8th is our annual school section lake uh, service. So uh, mark your calendars and make sure that stays free this summer. Okay, uh, we just want to extend a big thank you to everyone that participated in the uh, Grace House uh, work day yesterday. We got a lot of work done, and I think we had a fun time doing it. So uh, a big thank you to everyone that participated in that. Also, if you've been procrastinating about a window, your time is running out. We have eight windows left. So if you're thinking about sponsoring a window, we invite you to uh, do that quickly, or you might miss out. All right. Any other announcements? All right, with that, let's stand and sing. You can either take your hymnal and turn to page 495, or I believe the words will be up there as well, too. So.
not the matters of prayer and praise. desert while well, we were getting close but uh, you know praise the Lord for his reign and let's praise the Lord again by remembering what an awesome privilege it is to come into his presence with our our requests and our worship so let's join together in prayer my gracious father um, we thank you that you know our hearts and you still sent your son to die for us. Lord, right now, you know all our hearts here, those that are here, those that are going to be listening online, those that are outside listening to the radio. Lord, we just, we just pray that you will uh, meet every need because we know that there's a lot of uh, problems, every, every single human being. Um, is, is kind of desperate and fortunately Lord we're desperate for, for you and you have met those needs you ask us in, in your word to pray for the authorities and those that are over us Lord we ask that uh, you are an incredibly powerful God and, and we <clears throat> we know in Proverbs it says that you can you can change the king's heart like, like streams of water and Lord we ask that um, that our, our nation and our culture would be revived and to know you and, and to get back on the right path. Lord, um, this morning we're thinking of, of Simon and Laura. We, we um, praise you for their ministry here. We ask that you will give them a, a special grace um, as they're celebrating their anniversary. Um, and we have some really desperate situations for, with illness. Um, we think of Gideon and, and his needs and the whole Covey family and the Van Sickles. And Lord, we ask that you just, like Mike told us from Lamentations, that they would realize that underneath are your everlasting arms. Lord, if you have them in your arms, they can't be dropped. What a glorious thing that is. We, you know, as we pray for those in authority, we pray for this uh, rep representative from Texas, and Lord, we pray that you will uh, put a special hand of healing on him. Um, and Lord, as we in this state are seeming to go through another upsurge in COVID, Lord, we, we know you, you have said if we ask anything in your name, you would do it. And Lord, we ask that um, you would glorify yourself in, in this situation and help us to lean more fully on you. Um, again, we thank you for this time, and we thank you especially for this church, and we pray that you'll bless Teen Challenge as they, they uh, present to us your word and their testimonies. Again, we ask you to bless our time together. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Tim. At this time, we are going to turn it over to Pastor David and Teen Challenge. Well, good morning. It's good to be with you. Um, my name's uh, Dave Russell, one of the pastors at Western Michigan Adult and uh, Teen Challenge. And uh, I've had the privilege of working and around the Teen Challenge uh, ministry for 29 years. Uh, we are in our 51st year of ministry uh, in Muskegon at Western Michigan Adult and Teen Challenge. Uh, Pastor Phil McLean uh, left a small church in, in Whitehall, Michigan that he was pastoring and uh, all those years ago. And uh, he had read the book, The Cross and the Switchblade by David Wilkerson. And he said that that book changed his life and he felt God uh, beginning to call him uh, to go out into the streets and down on the beaches and the parks uh, where, where youth were out there 
hanging out and uh, drinking and drugging. And he went out there and started uh, preaching Christ uh, to them. And people began to get saved and come to the Lord. And uh, he started uh, our women's facility uh, in uh, 1970 and then our men's facility a few months later. And uh, we've grown today to, uh, we can house up to 96 men in our men's facility and around 50 ladies when we're full at, at our women's facility. And uh, we've seen many, many come to Christ over the years and watch God get into their lives and transform them. Um, I speak from personal experience. Uh, I came up 30 years ago from Florida uh, I was a long-haired hippie and uh, hooked on drugs, and uh, I gave my heart to the Lord at an altar at Teen Challenge. And uh, I remember the first day I was there, and uh, it was a Friday chapel, and Pastor McLean had preached a message, and uh, I came forward and accepted Christ into my life. And uh, if you would have come up to me and told me uh, as a, when I first got there, uh, I would be a pastor, uh, a teacher, a counselor, and would work in the ministry uh, for 29 years. I would have thought, uh, I'm not on drugs, you are, uh, you know, because I could never have seen that. But that's our God, and the Bible says he's able to do exceedingly abundantly above and beyond all we can ask or even think. Uh, students call us or contact us on the phone uh, and we interview them uh, for acceptance into the program. And then they come in and they begin a one-year discipleship uh, program and that's what we call it, a discipleship because we're discipling them after the Lord. And uh, we have a big emphasis on uh, teaching our students the Word of God. Uh, in lower growth, uh, they get the book of John and a book called Seeing the Story of the Bible so that they get a bird's eye view of the whole Bible and what it's about. Um, and they're, in lower growth, they have to memorize about 25 verses and all 66 books of the Bible before they move to upper growth. And then that last nine months in the program, uh, they have four uh, classes every month, and they're given a lot of homework to do. And uh, there's a lot of memorization that they're learning uh, in our classes. And uh, they pretty much get a lot of the Bible um, before they graduate Teen Challenge. And one of the reasons we emphasize teaching them the Word so much is uh, because of what the psalmist said, Thy word have I hid in my heart, that I might not sin against thee. And so we want them to, first of all, develop a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Um, I know I grew up in and around the church and had a little religion in my life, but I never had a relationship with the Lord. I never knew what it was to pray and, and uh, talk to God and and have that personal relationship and to be filled with his Holy Spirit in my life until I went through the program. And uh, these ladies that I've brought with me today uh, are from our women's facility and uh, God is working in their life and he has transformed and changed them from the time they came into the program. And I want you to hear this morning uh, some of their testimonies as to what God has been doing in their life. If you know someone that might be interested in the program, uh, we have some brochures with our phone number uh, on the back of those to our men's facility and our women's facility. And if you know someone that needs help, all they need to do is call us or go online. We have our web address on there and they can actually fill out an application uh, online and then talk to one of our intake directors. And uh, we want to help them if they want help. Uh, so please feel free after the service to 
come and see me and I can get you uh, that information. Uh, God has blessed us over the, this last year, and uh, we've pretty much been able to keep that COVID at bay uh, at the centers, and we're thankful to the Lord for that. Uh, we just started traveling and going back out on the road, and so sharing testimonies is kind of new uh, to these ladies, but I know that they'll speak from their heart this morning. And um, without further ado, I'd like to invite them to come. Y'all are standing in the corner over there. <laughs> Why don't you come over this way by me? Amen. And uh, they won't bite, <laughs> praise God. But I'd like you to hear some of their testimonies uh, this morning. And I'm going to start right on the end down here with Tori, if you would come and share. Um, hi, I'm Tori. I'm 21. Um, I grew up in foster care um, in a lot of different foster homes. I grew up around drugs and alcohol. Um, I just grew up with a very, with a lifestyle of seeing a lot of um, abuse and experiencing it myself and just being pushed around and feeling unwanted and just being that kid that's sitting in the corner that doesn't have a mom or a dad that doesn't know what it's like to be loved. So I went my whole life searching for that. Um, uh, I started lying a lot and trying to add value to myself that maybe if I said who made things about myself, that maybe that I would have that value, that someone would look to me and love to me. And then it got so bad that I didn't know what was real and what wasn't. And everything was just, I don't know, it was just so much chaos and confusion. Um, I was diagnosed with bipolar when I was 18. And I struggled with that chaos in my head that was just like, sounded like screaming thoughts all the time. And in the Bible, it says that God does not give us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And I can tell you today that I have a sound mind, that I can look at all of you and I can see you. I'm not afraid. God takes away that fear. And there's a verse, Mark 8:37. It's my favorite verse in the whole Bible. And it's a verse that I self-evaluate every single day. And it's, is anything worth more than your soul? Is the thought of getting married one day and having a future worth more than my soul? Is it, is it above God? Because God is in my soul and living in my heart. And is drugs or alcohol or lies or promiscuity or fear or shame or guilt or any of those things is any of those things worth more than your soul because i think that us being here today is showing you is is reaching out to one of you guys god is has something for everyone here and he just wants to speak to you today and i just hope that you guys can hear and listen and know and experience how much he loves you because if he didn't love us i wouldn't be here today Hi, I'm Brittany, I'm 30, and I'm from a farm in Wayland, so I really identify with this area, and that's really special. This is hard. <laughs> I um, grew up on a farm in Wayland, and I grew up with an amazing family. I had no excuse to go down the road that I did, but um, unfortunately I went down that, and uh, um, opiates and alcohol ruined my life. I had a good life, I had a good job, I had a simple, beautiful life, I was married. I'm the mother of three amazing boys, and um, I just never was complete in my heart and my soul. I never had that relationship with the Lord that Pastor Dave was speaking of, and I just tried to fill it, and unfortunately, I, I found painkillers, which led me to heroin, and I was addicted to that. I had the life that I always wanted. I started up there, and I went all the way down. I lost my family. I lost my jobs. I lost, um, I was in and out of jail, and to the point, uh, last year before I got to Teen Challenge, I was homeless downtown Grand Rapids, and I became a victim of human trafficking. And I was relocated to the, uh, by the police to Muskegon, to a domestic violence shelter. And by the love and mercy of God, I was called the Teen Challenge. And for the first time in my life, I feel complete. And I'm not afraid to be who I am. I'm very anxious, but I'm not afraid. And I just am so grateful for this program. The leadership in it just loves us so much to just relentlessly point us women and the men to our only hope, which is God. And it feels so clean and pure and loving. And um, I really do identify my favorite verse 
is um, starting at Psalm 107.4. And it says, They wandered in the wilderness in a, de a desolate way. They found no city to dwell in. Hungry and thirsty, their souls fainted within them. But they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them out of their distresses. And boy, he just did that for me. And I'm so grateful for this program. And I'm, honest, um, I'm honestly just so honored to be a child of God. Praise Thank you. Praise God. Hi, my name is Jennifer. Um, I'm 36 years old, mother of three. I had two wonderful, amazing parents. I was brought up in a Christian home. However, um, my dad knew religion. My mother knew the Lord. Um, I ended up taking care of both of them, uh, very terminally ill for many years, and they're both home with Jesus now. Um, my addictions were um, abusing alcohol, narcotics. It progressed to crack cocaine and methamphetamines. I was surrounded by gang violence. I was human trafficked, raped, and it was then um, I knew that I needed the Lord because I was brought up in that Christian home. I reached out to my pastor at Michiana Christian Embassy, and they brought me to Teen Challenge. It is there I have learned to build a very strong relationship with my Lord and Savior. Um, we learn the word daily. Uh, we're fed the word every day. Without the word, we cannot function. Um, at least I can't function. Um, I strongly suggest that if there's anyone that you know that needs help, this is a wonderful program. But more importantly, just knowing the Lord is, what, is where it's at. My name is Amy, and I'm older than most of the girls at Teen Challenge. I'm 50 years old. And um, so coming here was hard for me. First of all, I don't talk well in front of people, so bear with me. I apologize. Um, I've been a Christian for 25 years um, and an addict longer than that. Uh, I was what a lot of people would consider a functional addict until I wasn't. Um, I started having some trouble in my marriage about 10 years ago, and I remember the day that... Um, I took an extra pain pill and said, okay, I can handle these four kids. I can handle this bad marriage as long as I'm numb. Um, and that's when it all started to go downhill. Um, I have four kids. I was married. Um, I'm a registered nurse. Um, but through a series of poor decisions and opiates, uh, I lost my nursing degree. Not my degree, but my license. Um, lost my four kids and... Uh, got divorced two years ago. Um, that all brought me to a really hopeless place because that's all I had ever wanted in life was to be a caregiver, was to have a husband, a home, and beautiful children, and I had all that. But sometimes I think um, we're our own worst enemy. You know, we always think one more thing is going to make us better. One more thing is going to make us happy. Um, and I knew to turn to the Lord, but I didn't. I think I, think I just self-sabotaged. Um, in 2014, I attempted to take my life. I was uh, in a coma for 11 days on life support and kidney dialysis. Um, my husband had to plan my funeral. He had to buy my grave plot. And then miraculously, one day, at day number 11, I woke up. Um, and I've just searched for healing ever since. Um, I didn't believe I could live off of opiates um, until I came to Teen Challenge. And, and that's where I found new hope, hope that I can have a good life, hope that um, I will be reconciled with my family. Um, you know, when you get to a place where you're hopeless, you're so hopeless, you're in such a deep, dark pit that you can't even climb your way out of it. Um, there's really no reason to open your eyes in the morning. So I just am thankful and grateful for Teen Challenge, the Word of God, um, and their persistence in making sure that we're becoming whole. Thank you. Hi, my name is Jan. Um, I have been in the program um, going on three months. Uh, the way I got here just blows my mind, and ever since I've been here, God has been blowing my mind. I also grew up in the church. I grew up in a super conservative Dutch home, Hudsonville. I don't know if not very far from here. <laughs> I grew up with a lot of love, a lot of church, a lot of God, but just like you, no relationship. I didn't know that God could be so personal. I didn't know I could have uh, just such a personal relationship with God until uh, recently. Um, I won't go into details, but uh, I had a God in my life, and it was alcohol. Uh, stole everything from me. Um, I, it was my own fault. I mean, every choice I made was centered around alcohol. It controlled my life. 
Um, my children were raised by my sister. Um, I lost jobs, I lost homes, I lost my marriage. I was starting to lose my health. I could not get up and walk in the morning without drinking first. It was just getting scarier and scarier. Seizures, um, detoxes, hospitalizations. I mean, my life was out of control. Um, I had been doing good for a couple of months over the holidays this past year. Um, January, I messed up again. I messed up again. I was so full of shame, so full of guilt, so angry at myself. I did not want to put my family through it again. I didn't want to put anyone through it, myself, my health, my nothing. I was done. I just took off. I just left. I got in my car and I just drove. I was going to go south. I ended up going west. I ended up in Las Vegas. I'm like, I'm either going to find a new identity or take my own life. That's where I was at. I um, ended up in a hotel there, um, horrible feeling. I grew up with God, I had a fear of God. I didn't wanna, I was scared, I was so scared. I was, um, yeah, just walking around that hotel room like a caged animal and um, God, that's why no one ever can tell me that there is not a personal God, there is not, a, there's no one ever because in the midst of all of my horribleness, my phone went off and I'm like, oh no, what? But something told me, just get that message, get that text message. I got it, and it was a friend of mine that we had been um, accountable to each other, and it said, go on a teen challenge, see you in a year. All of a sudden, I just felt God. I felt God, like, I have hope, I have a reason to, I'm gonna live. Like, he is, he reached out to me in that super desperation at exactly the right time. And um, uh, so I knew, I mean, I called teen challenge, I knew I'd get in, because this is God working, he's not gonna say no to me after doing all this, so yay! So <laughs> I was halfway across the country, but I got back to Michigan, um, got into teen challenge, I've been here ever since. Yes, I have a new hope, I have a new uh, reason to live. I know that I know that I know I am heaven bound. I never had that security before. I used to search First John trying to find something, but no, I know God lives inside me. It's the best feeling ever. Um, no, I had to go through a lot of garbage, but you know what, it's all worth it in the end because like you said, is, is anything worth your soul? No, and I'm gonna have a life here, but I went for a new identity, I got it. I got the new identity in Christ. I went for a, to take my life, instead he gave me a new one. So I am so grateful for this program, for God, for how big he is, for how personal he is, and I'm just falling more in love with him every day. Amen. We serve a big God. We serve a big God, and he's still saving souls. Um, he's still reaching out to the lost, and he still goes out where the sinners are and draws them to himself. And uh, we were on our way over here, and we passed a farm, and there were some sheep. And I said, oh, look, sheep without a shepherd. And uh, uh, we kind of uh, laughed about that for a moment. But thank God we have a shepherd of our souls, and uh, his name is Jesus, and we're thankful uh, for that. And uh, our uh, program uh, is strictly uh, nonprofit, and one of the things I've always loved about our center is we've never told people they can't come um, for a lack of finances. And it's a lot of good people like you over the years that have been behind our ministry and, and helped support us so that we can keep helping people. Um, and uh, I know when I came uh, 30 years ago, uh, I had nothing except the, the bag in my hand. Um, that was all I had left. And um, I got the help that I needed as these ladies are getting the help that, that they need. And uh, so we don't take um, government funding or state funding because we don't want government and state rules. Um, we wanna be able to minister freely uh, Christ and be able to teach and preach the word. And we counsel from the Bible. We, we biblically counsel uh, our students and, and, and that's what we give them is the word. And uh, we try to get on the inside and see um, their hearts healed, their lives healed. Um, some uh, that we deal with have been grown up in even in abusive situations, um, broken homes, uh, and so on. And uh, we see God get a hold of them, turn their lives around, 
And uh, not only that, we see a lot of restoration at Teen Challenge, restorations of families, of marriages, uh, and so on. I've seen so many marriages healed um, at, at um, Teen Challenge and um, families restored over the years. And, and I thank God for that, um, that he does a complete uh, work. Amen. You ladies can be seated. I won't make you stand up here while I preach. Uh, praise God. Uh, thank you, ladies. Thank you. Praise God. I, I love what I do. <laughs> I love what I do. I left for two years uh, and pastored a small church up in Minnesota where it's really cold. And... Um, after a couple of years, the Lord began to speak to me and uh, show me that's not what he called me to do. And I called Brother McLean up and I said, um, I said, I'm out of God's will. I said, I'm, I, pastoring's okay, but I'm not doing, I think, what God called me to do. And he agreed with me. And uh, he said, your office has been empty for two years. I've been trying to fill your position, and I can't find anybody, and wanted to know when I was coming back. <laughs> and uh, so my wife and I came back to the Teen Challenge ministry, and uh, it brings me joy uh, to see God change these lives and, and work in these lives. Um, I want to talk to you this morning for a little bit about prayer and how important it is um, that we pray. It, it's easy to pray when times are desperate uh, or when times are difficult. Uh, those situations often bring us to our knees and seeking God and asking God to help us. But I, I feel that prayer is something we should do even when things are going good in our life because we don't know what's around the corner. We don't know what tomorrow holds. And we need to realize that the hour is desperate. And we as Christians need to be always watching and always praying. You see, God knows the dangers ahead, and we need to know that at any moment, despite times uh, that there may be just around the corner things that we don't expect in life. Sometimes it even seems when life is good, that is actually when we need to be praying so that when the hard place does come, we'll be better spiritually equipped to handle it. Jesus knew what his disciples were about to go through after he would go to Calvary. And in Mark chapter number 14, I'd like to read verses 26 through uh, 38. And this was the most desperate hour our Lord would face. And it says in Mark 14, uh, beginning with verse number 26, after singing a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. And Jesus said to them, You will all fall away because it is written, I will strike down the shepherd and the sheep shall be scattered. But after I have been raised, I will go ahead of you to Galilee. But Peter said to him, Even though all may fall away, yet I will not. And Jesus said to him, Truly I say to you that this very night, before the rooster crows twice, you yourself will deny me three times. 
But Peter kept insisting, or saying, insisting, even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And they all were saying the same thing also. They came to the place named Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, sit here until I have prayed. And he took with him Peter and James and John and began to be very distressed and troubled. And he said to them, my soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and keep watch. And he went a little beyond them and he fell to the ground and he began to pray that if it were possible, the hour might pass by him. And he was saying, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. And he came and he found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, notice he t uh, talks to Peter. Peter who so boldly said, I'll go to prison, I'll die, but I'll never deny you. And he comes and he finds them sleeping. And he said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not keep watch for one hour? Keep watching and praying that you may not come into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Jesus knew what the, he was about to go through, and he knew what the disciples were about to go through. Put yourself in the, in the disciples' shoes. They would watch their Lord be arrested, beaten, crucified, and die. And all of the disciples, along with Peter, were saying the same thing. We'll, we'll go with you to death. We'll go to prison. But Jesus singled out Peter, and, and I like the cross-reference in Luke 22, 31, gives us a little more detail as to the conversation between Peter and Jesus. And he says in, in Luke 22 and verse 31, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has demanded permission to sift you like wheat. What a statement. Satan has demanded permission to pulverize you, to sift you like wheat. So Jesus singled out Peter because Jesus knew his character. If you really study about Peter, Peter was bold. He was bold. Probably an old scrapper, you might say. When it came to facing people and dealing with people, Peter was kind of tough. He even pulled out his sword when they came to arrest Jesus, and he whacked off a guy's ear. Peter was a scrapper. And he might have had confidence to face any man, probably a tough guy, wasn't afraid of people. But Peter didn't understand was there, he was going to go through a spiritual battle. Spiritual battles can be brutal. They can be tough on any of us. And the devil wants to test our faith. The devil wants to do all he can to drive us away from Christ in times of desperation and in times of need. So Jesus understood the spiritual battle that Peter and the rest of the disciples were about to go through. Peter's character didn't seem in the natural afraid of confrontation. <clears throat> he wasn't afraid to pull his sword, fight. But Jesus knew Peter was no match for Satan. And he said, Satan's demanded to sift you like wheat. But thank God, Jesus goes on to say, but I've prayed for you. I've interceded for you. 
So Peter didn't know what he was about to face and go through. And, and the devil couldn't touch him as long as Jesus was with him. Jesus had been keeping them. John 17, 12 tells us where Jesus was praying his high priestly prayer for his disciples. I have lost none of these that you have given, given to me except one, the son of perdition. Speaking of Judas. But while Jesus was with them, the devil couldn't really get at his disciples. But now they would be left on their own when Jesus went to Calvary. And they did not know how to keep themselves. Later he tells them, as we read, to watch and to pray. Verse 32 there says that I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And you, once you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. So Jesus told Peter that he prayed for him. And, and notice what his prayer was, that his faith would not fail. See, the devil tries to chip away at our faith. If he can, he'll turn us from faith. Because he wants us to live in fear. He wants to torment us. He wants to torture us. But we have a great intercessor, and his name is Jesus. Jesus did more than just pray for Peter to be kept from stumbling. He prayed that he would be kept from complete falling away of faith in Christ, and, and that's the devil's goal. Where would we be if Christ and others had not offered up prayers for us? in our behalf. I, I had a praying grandmother. She was all of about four foot eight, something like that. But man, could she pray. And I didn't really, when I was in my mess, like to get around grandma. Because grandma had eyes of fire. <laughs> and she could look right through you. And she could tell when things weren't right in your life. And often my grandmother would tell me, David, I'm praying for you. I'm praying. I'm glad she did. Because it probably kept me out of death and hell. My mother would pray also. I'd come home four o'clock in the morning stumbling through the door drunk and my mother would be sitting in her chair with her Bible on her lap, sometimes on her knees, praying for me. One night I was, came through the door, drunk, middle of the night. My mother was there praying, and as I came in, she looked up at me with tear-filled eyes. I knew she was praying for me. And I looked right at her and I said, give it up, Mom, give it up. I'm glad she didn't give it up. <laughs> glad she didn't stop praying for a lost son. Thank God for Christ as our intercessor and other people that pray for us. But I want to tell you this morning, God wants us to learn to pray. We need to learn to pray for ourselves, and we need to learn to pray for others. And sometimes other people see the dangers and the perils in our life that we're completely blind to. Other people can see the dangers ahead. And Jesus saw what his disciples were about to go through. Jesus also knows our shortcomings and our weaknesses better than we do. And he is our great intercessor. We can read that in Hebrews 
chapter 7 and verse 25 that he ever makes intercession for us on our behalf. Jesus knew Peter was going to deny him. He knew that he was going to fail. But he also knew that he would come back. It's one thing to fail God. It's another thing to completely fall away from the Lord. And there are trials and there are tests that can come in our life at any moment that can cause us to fail and even have caused some to fall away from the faith. I've seen it over the years. Peter's overconfidence in himself, perhaps even his pride would not allow him to see what Jesus was talking about. How many times in love do people try to get you to see something in your life that can cause you to stumble? And we tell people, don't worry about me. I'll be just fine. Peter boasted of a future he could not see that Jesus did see. I'm ready to go with you to prison or even die before I'll fail you. One thing I've learned over the years, people who usually boast the loudest fall the hardest. We see in verses 35 through 38 that the smooth ride was going to be over and that things were about uh, to get rough back there in Mark. And uh, Jesus had went and prayed, verse 37, 1437 in Mark. He came and found them sleeping, and he said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Boy, we have to be careful not to be spiritually asleep. At a time when we should be praying and Jesus told them to come and pray with him, they were sleeping. Could you not keep watch for one hour with me? And Jesus said, keep watching and praying that you may not come into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. How often that's so true. We have a willing spirit. We want to do the right things. We don't want to fall away. But we're all in this. <laughs> we're all in this flesh. And a lot of times we can have a willing spirit, but our flesh takes over and we're weak in our flesh. We're weak in ourselves. Our own strength isn't sufficient. We need spiritual strength. We need spiritual empowerment in our lives. And the only way I know to get that is to pray. To be connected to God. To be in tune with the Lord. You see that personal relationship and those conversations with God is where we find strength when times are hard. I know I can't serve God in my own strength. I need his help, and I need the help of his Holy Spirit. And the only way to stay connected to me is through prayer, through talking to God. I've made it a habit every morning when I wake up to begin to talk to the Lord. And one of the prayers I often pray is, Lord, I can't get through this day without your strength without your help, without your power, without your enablement in my life. Because you don't know what the day is going to bring. Even though Jesus knew that he was about to undergo the greatest trial of his life, his first concern 
was still for his disciples. And he tells them, pray that you will not enter in to temptation. He had been praying for them, but now he instructs them to pray for themselves. Are we desperate to pray for ourselves even when things for the moment seem to be okay? Or are we saying, don't worry about me, I'll be all right? You see, there's a battle raging we can't see. Jesus told them to watch and pray. Watching has to do with being on alert. Being alert. It implies a constant vigilance at the present time. Even when things seem to be quiet, we need to be watching, alert, and praying. Romans 12, 12 says, be devoted to prayer. Be devoted to it. Ephesians 6, 18 tells us that our warfare against spiritual forces of wickedness that we can't see. We're fighting spiritual battles. And that should call us to an intensity in prayer. With all prayers and petitions and requests, praying in the spirit since it is a spiritual battle. Colossians 4.2 says, devote yourselves to prayer, keeping alert. Luke 8.1 says, we need to pray and faint not. Don't give up. 1 Thessalonians 5.17 tells us to pray without ceasing. That means all day long our thoughts ought to be going heavenward. He will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. God will keep us when we keep our mind and our thoughts and prayers for him. As I said earlier, it's easy to pray once times are desperate. That drives us to our knees. We're crying, God, help. But are we praying in preparation for what we may face tomorrow? That's the key. Philippians 4, 6 lets us know that prayer will bring the peace of God into our life and it will guard your hearts and your minds. We need God's help in prayer. We can't make it on our own. And I'll close with Luke chapter 21. Luke 21 and verses 34 through 36. It says, be on guard so that your hearts will not be weighed down with dissipation, drunkenness, the worries of life, and that the day will not come on you suddenly like a trap. For it will come upon all those who dwell on the face of the earth Here's the verse I really want to bring out. But keep on alert at all times, praying that you may have strength to escape all these things that are about to take place and to stand before the Son of Man. So we're to keep watching, keep praying, be on alert. This is speaking of trials that will come at a future date before the coming of the Lord but we don't know when that day will be. But we always are encouraged by Jesus to keep watching and to keep praying and realize that our strength is limited. His strength is limitless. Father, we thank you for your word today. God, I pray that all of us We'll find ourselves praying every morning when we wake up, throughout the day and in the evening before we go to bed. 
Lord, teach us to pray as your disciples asked. We need to pray and find strength in you every day. We might be going through trials and tests right now, Lord, and I pray that you would strengthen each one in this room and everyone who's listening. But Lord, we may need strength for tomorrow. So help us to look to you, to look to your power and your strength, not our own, to get us through every life situation. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor David. Uh, let's all stand and uh, turn your hymnals to page 441 for a closing song. are not consumed for his compassions they never fail they are new every morning every single morning great is your faithfulness i say to myself the lord is my portion therefore i will wait on him you're dismissed Don't forget to subscribe to our channel by clicking the link on the upper left hand side of your screen so you can see all of our videos when they come out. Or you can watch last Sunday's sermon by clicking the video link on the bottom left of your screen. From all of us at Sylvester Community Church, thank you and God bless.